Alright guys, have you ever heard anybody say, you are what you eat? Well, what does you eat made out of? I'm sure you've studied nutrition before and things like fats and carbohydrates and calories. Um, but today we're going to talk about the four organic molecules. What are those? So the organic molecules that are present in an organism uh, because of eating and digestion are used to build cellular structures like cell membranes and organelles, as well as repair damaged cells and tissue. And what's crazy is all the diverse structures of different organisms are made from the same basic molecules, and we're going to talk about those today. Now, be sure you get this straight. In biology, organic means relating to organisms, things that contain covalently, covalently bonded carbon not grown without the use of antibiotics, pesticide, or other industrial chemicals. We are going to forget that definition in biology class. That's something different. Organic means in biology something relating to carbon. Carbon, carbon, carbon. So think organic in biology class, think carbon. All organic molecules contain covalently bonded carbon. And what's really cool about carbon is that Carbon atoms can bond to other carbon atoms, which gives carbon the ability to form really, really long chains, almost unlimited in length. And these carbon-carbon bonds can be either single, double, or triple. And the chains can be straight or branched or even shaped in rings. So carbon is unique in that it can form millions of different large and complex structures. Now there's a really good video about carbon. I'll put the link for it in the description for this video that you might want to check out if you're interested in the molecular structure of these organic compounds. So remember, all organic molecules contain covalently bonded carbon. So when we're thinking about carbon as the base of all these organic molecules, um, we need to think about how it cycles through all living things, through processes like photosynthesis and cellular respiration and death and decomposition, um, pooping, all that stuff. Carbon is there and cycling through the world. Okay, so just a quick little background on how these four types of organic macromolecules are formed. Um, there's a few different chemical processes that I want to talk about really quickly, um, and then we can move on to naming these molecules. So, the first one will be polymerization. So small units, which we call monomers, are going to be joined together to form large units, polymers. So the making of polymers is polymerization. Dehydration synthesis, think about when you're dehydrated, you lose H2O, and that's exactly what happens here. So dehydration synthesis is going to join molecules together by removing water. And finally, the opposite, hydrolysis. When you get hydrated, you're adding water. So that's going to break molecules apart by adding water. So these two are opposites of each other. Okay, so what are the four organic molecules? Well, the big categories of the four organic compounds or molecules are lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. Talking about it is making me hungry. Mmm, I have this nice burger right here. Mmm, looks really good. I think I'm going to eat some of it. And as I eat it, I uh, hope you guys aren't hungry because we're going to be talking about the organic compound. So I'm sure you're just starved with anticipation. The four organic molecules are lipids, proteins, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. I'm sure you've heard of some of these before, but we're going to go through them one by one. So what organic molecules do you think can be found in a cheeseburger? Well, you see the nutrition facts here. You've probably maybe, maybe looked at those before. I don't know. It depends on what you care about, what's in your food. Um, but we're going to pay attention to things like carbohydrates, protein, and lipids. Fat um, is lipids. All right, so what part of this burger do you think has the most carbohydrates? Well, you probably already guessed it. Well, probably if you've ever heard of a low-carb diet, you know people like to avoid eating things like cheeseburgers, hamburgers, because the bun has so many carbs. Now let's get to the nitty-gritty stuff about carbs. So carbs are composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. That means for every one carbon in a carbohydrate atom, there are two hydrogens and one oxygen. Carbohydrates are used for short-term energy storage, quick energy, you eat it quick, um, and structural, structural support. You can sometimes recognize uh, the name of a carbohydrate molecule because it ends in O-S-E. These three letters, O's, are going to generally mean a sugar, like cellulose, or glucose, or fructose, or lactose. So our simplest sugar, like glucose, C6H12O6, which we'll need to make energy, um, 
is going to be called a monomer, a monomer, because there's just one of it, one molecule of it. Um, so one sugar, we also call a monosaccharide, mono meaning one, saccharide meaning sugar. Um, and we can find glucose um, in fructose in plants, and animals get galactose, another simple sugar, uh, from milk. When we bump up to something with two molecules of sugar together, we call that a disaccharide. Di meaning two, saccharide meaning sugar. And we call this a polymer, something that has more than one of the original um, unit in it together. So we're starting to make a longer chain here. Um, disaccharides are like sucrose and maltose, and we can find lactose in milk. More than three sugars, we're going to call it a polysaccharide. Poly meaning many, um, and these are also polymers, and things like starch and cellulose, which are difficult to us, for us to digest sometimes, um, can be found in plants, and glycogen can be found in animals. Okay, why are these carbohydrates so important for energy? So, um, Many animals store extra sugar as glycogen, glycogen stores. Um, so it's stored in your muscles and it's going to supply energy for movement. Glyco glycogen that's stored in your liver is released when um, your blood sugar or your glucose is going to run low. So this is an example of homeostasis, remember, maintaining our internal balance, um, it's really important. Plants are going to store excess sugar as starch, which we like to eat, and plants also make cellulose, which is strong and rigid and it's used for support, but we cannot digest that, actually. Um, so that just passes through our digestive system when we try to eat it. Okay, so what about, like, lettuce? Lettuce is another plant. Why is it not considered a good source of carbohydrates? Well, cellulose is a polysaccharide common in green plants. So we talked about cellulose. It's one of the really long, long glucose, or long sugars. The human body can't break down cellulose for energy, so it's not treated as a source of carbohydrates. When you eat a lot of leafy green vegetables, um, you don't gain a lot of energy. Cellulose is made of bonded glucose molecules, so lots and lots of glucose together. All right, next question. Which part of the cheeseburger is the best source of protein? Okay, so now we're going to talk about proteins. Now, proteins are present in every cell, tissue, and organ in our bodies. And these proteins are constantly being broken down and replaced. So you think about protein, okay, I want to eat protein, I want to get muscle, I want to get big and strong. Protein isn't just for your muscles. Again, it's for every cell in our bodies. And we'll talk about all these different types of proteins that our bodies know how to make um, in order to you know, fulfill daily functions. So proteins have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen in them. Same stuff but we're adding, as the sugars, but we're adding nitrogen. It's going to provide structure for cells, bones, muscles, tissues, organs, hormones. Most everything in the body um, does what it does because of proteins. And really importantly, there are some special proteins called enzymes that help with cell metabolism, which is, again, how we get our energy. So the protein in the food that we eat is digested into amino acids um, that are later used to build and replace other proteins in our bodies. So a protein is made of a long chain of amino acids, and that's the monomer, the functional unit, the very, very base of a protein. And if you put a lot of amino acids together, you get your protein. Um, when the amino acids join, they form a polymer called a polypeptide, lots and lots of peptide bonds. To it's because the monomers in a protein are held together by peptide bonds. So, bummer thing, proteins can be destroyed by extreme heat. When you have a fever, these proteins are start to unfold, and they have a very specific folding structure. And when they unfold, they lose their shape, they aren't able to do the jobs they're supposed to do anymore, um, and we feel the effects. So this is called denaturing, when a protein is destroyed or loses its shape. So let's talk a little bit more about protein structure. Now, we know amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So this is the structure of a general amino acid. Um, at the top, we have a hydrogen here. This is our hydrogen. In the center of it all, you see is a carbon. Very good. Um, another side is our carboxyl group. Car carboxyl right here. This is our carboxyl group. You can see there's an oxygen with a negative charge um, on one end. On the other side, over here, um, we have what's called our amino group, our amino group. And when these form chains together, this amino group can bond to another carboxyl group on the other side of another 
um, amino acid. And down here we have what's called our R group, which can change. There's, there's no R element that's there. Um, it's just a different position for other things to attach to. So what's cool is that, um, making this look more like a double bond and not a triple bond, um, all amino acids have the same amino group and the same carboxyl group, so they all look like this for that part. Um, but each amino acid has its own unique R groups, so this changes um, with each of the 20 different essential amino acids. And what's crazy is only 20 amino acids can combine in different arrangements to form all the different types of proteins in our bodies. And shape is super important. If a protein's not the right shape, it can't do its work, or it might only have partial function. So think about that. 20 different amino acids, only 20, to get all the different proteins to make up all the living things on Earth. Why does the meat have so much protein? Well, it's kind of a wimpy burger, after all. So not that much protein. So back to this question, why does the meat have so much protein? Why do people say, eat meat if you want a lot of protein? Well, beef comes from the muscles of the cow, and muscle cells are packed with lots of protein machinery that makes small motions that create larger muscle, muscle motions. So we need this muscle part of an animal um, because there actually are a lot of proteins within the muscle. Not that there aren't other places as well, and you can find proteins in lots of different plants um, as well as animals. What part of this burger has the most fat? Well, lots of it, but let's talk first about the cheese. Okay, so what is fat? Fats are a type of lipid. Lipid, it's another one of our organic molecules. Lipids, like we said in our water properties video, are hydrophobic, water-fearing. They don't like water. So lipids include fats, oils, waxes, phospholipids, and steroids. Lots of different things. So generally in lipids, we have really long carbon chains. Those are characteristic of lipids. Um, this is a triglyceride right here with three different chains, um, carbon chains on it. Okay, so like I said, lipids are long chains with lots of carbon and lots of hydrogen, um, but little or no oxygen. So we, if we look over here at our molecular structure, we can only spot a few oxygen here and there. Um, within this particular lipid. So the monomers of lipids can be uh, one glycerol and three fatty acid chains. Um, and when you put them all together, we get lipids. That's a polymer. So lipids are used for long-term energy storage. This is energy we're going to put away um, and save for later, or something we can turn into energy later, actually. Um, and excess fat in your cells is going to, and your body is going to be stored in lipocytes, which are special cells, um, and they expand in size until the fat is used for fuel. They're also used for protection, for insulation, for waterproofing, um, different types of parts of the body, for cell membranes, and as chemical messengers like steroids. Um, they're super, super important within every single one of our cells because phospholipids, a type of lipid, actually make up all of our cell membranes. So every single one of our cells needs fat. Imagine that. So the cell membrane is composed of a lipid bilayer, which serves as a barrier. The fluidity of the membrane allows for movement of proteins about the membrane as well as the movement of vesicles in and out of the cell, which is really important. Um, and lipids also serve in membranes surrounding cellular organelles. So different things like um, the mitochondria actually has a lipid membrane as well. So, you might have heard of saturated and unsaturated fats before, and those do exist. So, what this actually means on a molecular level, whoops, is that saturated fats or lipids have single bonds, single bonds here, um, throughout their carbon chains. Unsaturated have maybe one or two double bonds, which is going to cause... Um, the fat to be easier to digest, um, they're going to be liquid at room temperature, and they won't hold as many hydrogen atoms as possible. So they're not filled with hydrogen atoms, they're unsaturated, whereas saturated fats are filled with as many hydrogens as possible. And it's actually easier for your body to break down double bonds than single bonds, so this is easier to break. So why are there so many lipids in cheese? Cheese is made of milk of various animals, like cows or goats or sheep. And milk is meant to feed the animals and give them everything they need to grow. In the process of making cheese, these organic molecules such as lipids and proteins are concentrated into a solid form that contains a high amount of both lipids and proteins. All right, so we're missing one organic compound, which is our nucleic acids. So how do nucleic acids relate to the cheeseburger? All right. And where are the nucleic acids in this burger? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to taste and find out. 
Well, what we'll learn later is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into proteins. DNA to RNA to proteins is the central dogma. It's really important in biology. But let's go back up. What are nucleic acids? So all DNA and RNA are name, made of the same five nucleic, nucleic acids, adenine, guanine, thymine, uracil, and cytosine. The structures of all of these include carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and phosphorus. So how do nucleic acids relate to this cheeseburger? Well, remember, DNA, our genetic material, is inside every cell of every living thing. So all of these things came from a living thing. The bun came from wheat, the tomato came from a tomato plant, the meat came from this muscle cells of an animal. So all of those cells contained DNA. I'll see you guys now. Bye.